Welcome to Mental Health and You. This podcast brings you the best information and advice from across the Norfolk and Suffolk Foundation Trust. Every fortnight, we will hear from one of our specialist areas, be it school and parent support, the recovery college, well-being or research. So welcome to the NSFT Research Podcast. Um, Today we'll be talking about the MIND study. This is an NIHR funded study looking at improving the discharge experience from acute mental health hospitals, but more on that in a minute. First introductions. Um, So my name is Lisa, I'm the MIND study manager and I'm joined by Sarah and John. Um, Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, so um, my name's Sarah Ray. I have um, experience of mental health challenges, which include two admissions. Well, they were actually quite long stay admissions. And it was really after spending eight months on an acute care ward that I became interested in trying to influence the design and the delivery of mental health services through my work as a trustee of National Mind. Um, involvement, increasing involvement in research activities as I became more confident and restraint reduction programmes. And how about you, John? Yes, so I am John Wilson. I'm a psychiatrist in in NSFT and a clinical senior lecturer at UEA. Um, I'm a research director at NSFT. I'm also a consultant psychotherapist and I've had a long interest over many years really in social recovery, which is quite a challenging idea really of, of, of starting to 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 pitch psychiatry from a different perspective rather than an illness perspective. So um, and one of my roles really is either conducting or or helping develop research within uh, NSFT. That's great, thank you. Um, So to get us started, I thought first off we could talk about what made you kind of what's the motivation behind Minds? I think you both already started talking about that. And maybe how did you both meet? How did it all start? For me, the the the, the, the motivation and, and the driver was quite my own experience of discharge, which on both deca- both times I was discharged was actually very distressing and a process that was really fraught with anxiety. And then I, you know, obviously shared my experience with other people who'd been discharged from hospital. And it was interesting because their experiences were very similar or or, or, or even different as well. But in the, mostly the, the sort of common factor was that people had a poor experience. So maybe for different reasons than mine, but yeah, generally speaking, there were people, people were describing something that had been um, a traumatizing experience. And then, I suppose I didn't really do anything about that, or I didn't really feel an urge to to do something until Mind published their leaving hospital survey in 2017. And they'd it was quite a, a large survey. They'd, they'd uh, got, a, I think it was uh, over a thousand respondents. And really, it what struck me was that it, well, it was harrowing to read. I actually read a lot of the the um, the the, the, the uh, testimonies that people had written, and that was harrowing. And it actually confirmed my idea that what what people had told me anecdotally was was you know was actually happening more on a wider scale. Um, I think their experiences they resonated with my own experiences very much mirrored them. So, for example, we know uh, from that survey that. of respondents were not involved in discharge planning and fewer than 9% felt fully involved. One in three people were discharged within with less than 48 hours notice, which when you think that the MIND guidelines say that people should be given at least 48 hours notice is really very concerning. Absolutely. So, John, what was your... My motivation, well, I, a, I suppose building off what I said before, Sarah, that the the um, with my work hat on, you know, we have a research development program. It's it's a unique. It's the only one in the country, actually. And um, and people are now coming to find out how it works. And we and we, we have a, a series of themes. One of which is adult mental health. Um, um, but we are 
we're developing a niche for something which is much less around drug trials, in fact, not at all around drug trials, and much more nuanced around what will make a difference to people's actual lives or experiences, which is a very difficult area to research, actually. And Karina Hackman, who leads that stream, has a particular interest as well. I, I knew that in, in, in sort of service user experience or points of view. And we've published on this quite a bit. So with, with my work, Hunter, I'm, I'm, one of my jobs is to help, I suppose, Horizon Scan helps spot things that we, we, we should be backing in, in terms of research that will pursue that theme of, of meaningful research that will make a difference to the people using our services' lives. And, and we have lots of ideas coming up all the time. Sarah and I met, didn't we? You can maybe talk about your take on that, Sarah. But we met at a conference um, for the East of England Art launch, I think, or something like that. And on the back of that, mine's sort of kick-started slowly, slow burning from my point of view, but actually evolved from there. Well, you, you tell us your take on how we met, Sarah. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I was struggling a bit at that point because... The difficulty for me is someone with lived experience, I didn't have a track record of holding large grants, which I knew was a requirement if you were going to be successful in obtaining NIHR, National Institute for Health Research and Care funding. So I had to find someone who had that credibility, but also someone that I felt that was in it for the right reasons uh, that I could relate to. And I suppose that's one of the things that I knew that John, I'd, through a previous programme that I'd been involved with, I had met John, so I knew a little bit about him. I heard, you know, good things about him on the grapevine. And when we had our first meeting um, after the, the, um, the event in the East of England, I think what struck me was that John could really see the importance of this work. He, he was, the buy-in, you know, he had for it. He was, he was driven... You know, he was really enthusiastic and driven a bit like myself to improve services for people who are um, being who are moving from an inpatient acute care setting back to the community. He could see the relevance of it and how it might improve people's lives. And I think for me, that was the really important thing. First of all, that he, he was someone that I thought I could work with well and um, I thought he had all the right you know, attributes. And then I also felt that we would make a great and we would make a great team because we were driven by or or not driven necessarily, but motive same had the same motivation. And it came, didn't it, from Sarah, from you at that a conference of I possibly in the stairwell, I can't remember now, but um saying, Oh John, can, can we can we have a word and I've got this yes. one page proposal of an idea and we had a talk about it and um it, it did tick my boxes. It ticked my but you did in the sense that it was authentic and real and you know and there was a passion in you to, to genuinely make a difference. And 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 that's if you're gonna do research, you you've, it's only worth doing if you're gonna make a difference, I think. And 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 it felt to me when I talked to Karina, we've got something there's something really in this. I don't know how we're gonna do it, I don't know what it will end up as, but and it's quite complicated, but there's something real here that needs that needs to happen. And Sarah is probably the catalyst around which we should put now until that point we'd only really worked with other academics or ourselves so it was new territory for us in that sense so. but um yes it, it and, and and then saying to karina look i think well, she, she said is this something you want to focus on yes it, it, it is i know you've not met sarah but it, it is i think this is something we need to just start to develop an idea of and then it started to, to pull together didn't it um in a complex way sort of led by you and sort of led by us and Karina until we sort of formalised how we were going to take things forward, which was a, which was a long process, actually, because an, an idea of improving discharge to a scientific way of doing that is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a is a long step of how, how will you know and all those sorts of questions. Um, but yes, that, 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 that's how and we, we just kept meeting with Drive to New Market and catch up, wouldn't we, Sarah? And, and you had a small team already at the time who you you were starting to think some ideas through that we joined and then we, yeah yes yes exactly i had already through previous involvement with research projects i knew quite a few people who i thought might be interested and i just went about approaching them on a sort of you know one to one basis and um yes and i think think you know i knew nothing about or very little about the process of getting developing a bid from the very start to getting to a place where it was, you know, ready to submit as an application. Um, and I was sort of 
quite surprised for how long we were we were really um, we couldn't you know we couldn't see the wood for the trees. We had to try and narrow down the scope and ensure that we focused. We decided in the end to focus on this this sort of more of the discharge planning in hospital rather than you, to try and cover discharge from um, the hospital end and the community side of things would have been a, just you know too big too big we had to get that we had to get that focus and we had um i had support from from advisors from the research design service east of england and they were very good at keep reminding us that we had to get that we had to be really really clear about where the boundaries of you know the work was where how yeah how it was um how it needed to be focused that, yeah so that's yeah, that's how it all that's how we met and how it came about lisa <laughs> match made in heaven yeah. so it sounds like it so you had the initial idea and you kind of met and that all seemed great and Sarah you're telling us that kind of you already knew people from different projects and kind of focusing the scope is, is really important when kind of designing um, a research projects and being successful in getting funding so, so where did you go from there so well I just talked from my perspective for me one of the most important things if you're going to do research and do it well and you know generate robust findings is that you've got to involve the people with who have ex, who have experience in that area people with lived experience who can shape inform contribute particularly you know particularly in that in the development of the proposal so we did quite a lot of public and uh, patient and public involvement work at that stage to really hear from people who had that direct experience being discharged, what were their views? What, what Was it a good experience? Was it a bad experience? If it was a bad experience, particularly why it was a bad experience? What could have been done differently? We wanted to capture all that information. And we also talked to staff because that they have an equally important perspective. Um, so I think for me, that, that was one area that I particularly focused on in the development of the of the bid was going out and talking to other people who could um, really really give us a um, an understanding of what was happening on the ground um, we, went, we went around in circles a lot didn't we so because we at, did for instance at some point we might we might come up with a solution and then do it you know, you know research can ask the wrong question Sarah's really right but by try to get funding you have to have an outcome that that, that, that is academically acceptable in a sense, you might be answering the wrong question. Or, um, so, so getting that bit right was, but it makes it more complicated. So, if we initially we had some ideas of how we might solve the problem, do we do a trial just solving it with what we wanted? And we went round and round, didn't we? Say that. And for instance, there's nice guidelines on how to do a discharge from hospital. It's very clear what's meant to happen. So, which then begs the question: so, so why doesn't that happen for most of the time, as Sarah's just talked about? So, we started to ask richer but more complicated questions didn't we Sarah as to what, what are we trying to do here we, you know we are and do we have to kind of go back a step and that's something I learned actually from the Clark and the Ark that's a translation of in, in into into practice thing you, you know what, what what can we come up with go back a step don't assume you, that you know and that's and so that's where Sarah's involvement was was so useful to going back to this keep reminding going back to you know what what's the perceived problem from Certainly, the, from the service user's point of view, um, I used to run acute wards, you know, and I, you, you try to do a good job. You think you're doing a good job, you know. You don't go into work thinking I'll I'll do an unsafe or bad discharge. So, from everyone's perspective, as Sarah says, ha what's getting in the way of nice guidelines happening as it's meant to happen? Probably most of the time. Um, yeah. So, uh, and as Sarah says, she had a good, a really good team actually, but our expertise was then around I suppose, methodology and thinking how do we do this and how do we, what's the science behind it but trying to always match it to, to Sarah's initial passion and vision of what she wanted to achieve which we end up with you know a, a, a quite a complex uh, real it's called a realist review which essentially looks at uh, in the real world what is happening what are, what are, what are the things going on why do things happen in a certain way and it and you can refresh and refine what you're looking at using this methodology mm -hmm. Karina had just done a training in it, so that was quite handy. Um, and we knew people that, that that were good at this and really nice to work with. So we had some contacts and we then we had we knew other people from Sarah that we've over the time we've sort of 
drawn into that. And then Sarah's made other suggestions, big ones, I have to say, around the um, Cambridge Engineering Engineering Design Service, who I knew of and Karina had worked with, but Sarah had good contacts with. And that 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 for me was a, was a stroke of genius, Sarah. When you when you said to us, you know, I, what about these guys, Alex? You know, um, they've never done anything in this area, but could they help us? Um, would you agree, Sarah? That 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 really started to pull it together. We're going to design a fresh, a way of doing things properly. Yes, I I totally agree. I mean, I think we'd all got a bit, I don't know, not exactly despondent, but we couldn't quite see how we were going to approach this. And as I suggested that we, you know, that um, Alex Kamashi uh, from the Engineering Design Service came and talked to us. And gave, he gave a presentation. And I think really it was a light bulb moment for the for the team. Everybody said, well, you know, that's a really interesting approach, this systems approach, systems engineering approach. And it people suddenly became, I think everything became more tangible. There was we something we could to... focus on. We had a focus, didn't we? So, so, the, so, we, we, so the, the trial starts with looking at what's going on at the moment and, and why, and observing wards, talking to staff, talk to, talking to service users and carers and finding out what's going on. And then giving that to Alex's team, uh, uh, well, and does. And then we start to use those same or similar people to design, well, how might we get mm -hmm. around these we come up with some theories as, as 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 to what needs to change and how might you do that. And of course, engineers approach it not just as in clinicians will approach it by saying, well, well, if we give this tablet, that problem goes away. A ward is a complex system within a complex area, Norfolk and Suffolk, say, or London, within a complex national policy framework uh, with different people inputting all the time. So how do we do it genuinely? And the design tool, I think, was the, with the genius there, because that allows us to look at different levels as to what can we change, what can't we change? Um, what's the scope of what we're trying to change? The quite fundamental questions. And and um, so and, and the sort of acceptance, we're not going to come up with, you know, here's a here's a goodie bag, use this goodie bag and it will solve every every war's problems in the world. It's much more sophisticated than that, I think. So would you what we're going to oh, what, what I, yes. In fact, we don't know what we'll produce, do we? We yet? don't know what we're going to produce. What we're calling it is a systemic discharge care approach, but we have no idea exactly what that will entail. Uh, one thing we are certain about is it just won't be, it won't just be a checklist. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, there are lots of checklists already which, and things get in the way of them being followed. So, so we, th we're trying to dig into what are those things are yes. getting in the way. And, and just, to, just to be clear, so we're using two wards in Norfolk and Suffolk, two in Elft in London, and for sort of a, a different population types and two in Hertfordshire two wards there, so which we're going to sort of mm. investigate, aren't we, in, in detail. Yes. And then we would hope that those same wards and staff will help us design the next the product and then test it whilst we observe what's going on all over again. So, so you know, it's, it's, it's pretty rich research, but and yet it's scientific. So we, we will know what we're finding. We'll know what we're not finding as we go along. Yes, it's really that ability to sort of drill down into those problem areas and, and also to find out what's working well. That's equally important. Yeah. Um, and I think, as John said earlier, staff don't come into this their jobs to do a bad job. And they're equally frustrated by not being able to deliver care that they may, would probably want the, the level, the, the high standard of care that they would want to deliver, largely due to system pressures. So it sounds like in kind of the bottom line is to really involve people with lived experience in that and kind of as you're saying at the start it's not so much about outcome per se it's about finding the right outcome and I guess the unique thing about Minds is is that it's taken the first year to really understand the problem yeah. and kind of involving um, people throughout the study to develop something and I guess it's it's quite unique in the sense that it hasn't got any preconceived ideas about what what it'll end up being. Definitely. So we've both learned a lot, haven't we, Sarah, along, the, along this journey so far? And we've ended up with, with methodologies that we don't fully understand, which when you're leading in something like this is, is, is could cause anxiety. But because we've got such faith in this team, it's quite a big team, that all they all know their bits really well. That uh, And of course yourself, Lisa, that, 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 that we, you know, we've got confidence that we've got something right here that, that will produce something, even though that some of the detail is beyond our ability to understand. 
lots of experts involved though and that's I guess why you talked about kind of assembling your team at the start Sarah and kind of finding the right people and expertise to work together. Um, so John, so you started mentioning about um, kind of working together, leading this project and Minds is also a co-produced study. I was wondering if you could both share some thoughts or initial thoughts on what it's like to co-lead the project and on doing it in a co-produced way. Yeah. You go first, John. OK, I am. I, um, now, clearly, I would want to see myself who does everything in a, in a kind of collaborative co-produced way, every clinical decision. I am aware, though, that that's not always how it feels to whether it's clinical care or whatever. And even if I try to, um, you know, involve a certain sort of group of person in, in, to develop a trial, it's, it's very easy for me to, as I said, impose an idea and say, do you think I've gone on the right track? And they say yes or no, and then we move on. Developing the youth service was done very much with young people, and it really opened my eyes to Actually, what they're asking for is is perfectly reasonable, makes absolute common sense, actually. So, so if you really do listen, you can. But there are lots of things get in the way, particularly when we have technical knowledge versus not technical knowledge and things like that. So, but having said that, I am aware that it, it, it you know, it, it poses, it potentially poses challenges, um, power challenges, you know, and authority challenges and also, and, and they come up in lots of little ways. Fortunately, Sarah is not averse to pointing these out, which is a good thing. I'm not saying that's um, if she notices them. And I try to sometimes overcompensate, which can be patronising <laughs> the other way around. So we've had to work it all out over, I don't know how many years now, so is it three years? It's, it's gone a long time and, and it's evolved, hasn't it, into um, I'd say a peer relationship rather than a co -produ you know, it, 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 that's what it feels like to me. We, we bring different things to it and I'm not the expert and she's not the expert, but, you know, we, we, we try to figure out what we're trying to do and how we articulate that. Um, but it has had its challenges. Um, little things like the NHR, the national, the, 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 who, the, we got awarded a million pounds to do this. Nobody thought that would happen. And they've just kept emailing me because I'm the, I'm the, I'm the clinician, despite Cara, Sarah being clearly identified as a co you know, the, the co-chief investigator. Uh, so all through the system, there were lots of these things, aren't there, Sarah? Commit? Getting paid expenses was just sort of complicated. I don't know why it was, because you don't you don't live in Norfolk and Zephyr. And um, there were lots of sort of silly but critical things that made me think every step when Sarah noticed it, or I noticed it on her behalf, gosh, the... the We've got to really work hard to make sure that we are both equals in this. That, yeah, so that's that's my tip on it. But it, going back to why we're doing this, for me, it makes it feel authentic. It, it, it's worth the effort, and we and we we have actively tried to have reflective groups and between ourselves and and to really think through: is this working? Why not? If not, and and start to trust each other enough to be able to say. Actually, when you said this, I felt this sort of thing. You know, not not therapy groups, but still, with, with, with the aim of with the aim of making the process really work and, and not just be ticking boxes. That's my take on it, Sarah. I don't I don't know. Well, it must feel quite daunting from your point of view. I don't know. As you say, I am able to. I suppose by now I'm an expert by experience with teeth, and I am able to say things that. Um, going back a few years, when I had very little confidence, I wouldn't be have been able to say. I think, yes, we've, we've really tried to think how we can build in reflective practice, not just between ourselves, but also in the team to think how how everybody's feeling. And um, I think with co-production, doubly important, really, because what my aim from the very outset was, was to try and ensure, and, and this is a huge challenge, it's not just saying we're going to co-produce something and it all happens and it all falls into place. For a start, there's no one definition of co-production. And actually, it's it's quite hard to achieve and meaningfully achieve. So but I, I wanted to give, you know, really, really put as much effort into that as I could, that side of the, the project. So we have also um, got researchers who are co-leading each work package who have their own lived experience and then we have a lived experience advisory group we're working with 
who some of whom they're all people with lived experience either as carers or people who have had to who have accessed mental health services and we really want to co-produce the work with them um, in reality time and resources make that that quite difficult and um, we we are going to involve them in all the key decisions but there are a lot of things that we will learn on this journey we are not saying we're doing everything right to start with it will be an iterative in process of improvement and learning for us and learning from other you know learning what other people are doing and what works so i think you know i i, I think it is going to be um a more co-produced project than the many projects that say that they have been which is you know co-produced which as john said can be quite tokenistic you could have just um, a group of people with lived experience rubber stamping a research idea but we really want to hear uh, for example so we had people with lived experience involved in our ethics application they're, they're now um, prioritizing the they've been involved in a prioritization exercise for the interview questions they're, they're very they're very um, keen and enthusiastic about really having a say in this research and and uh, and and shaping the direction you know of it because let's face it if you're not at the table you're on the menu you know and they will ensure this ensures that the research is much more relevant and tailored to the needs of people who are being discharged because if, if John and I just sat down we could think oh well this needs to happen that needs to happen and then everything will be tickety-boo but actually so we wouldn't we wouldn't have enough between us we would not have enough knowledge to know what what would make the process work and I think that researchers can and overlook problems that are really important overlook issues that are really important to people with lived experience or they may just dismiss them. They may think, oh, that's not even, you know, that's not even um, important. So that's why you've got to be working with the people who who have that um, expertise and experience. I mean, we have got, us, um, uh, uh, you know, we we uh, one thing we I think we're both scared of doing it not well because it, it, it was the NHR's study of the month. You know, it's been picked up as actually something this is something yes. quite innovative. We're doing talks of the patient safety at the health service journal patient safety conference it's being picked up as something which is actually is. A, a bit different and that sort of scares me a little bit or worries me a little bit that, that we're getting it wrong but we chose a study steering commission which oversees sort of supervises or, or, rub, or signs off on our work and typical to say now we chose you know people that will be very critical of what we're doing potentially in a good and bad way um so we're not you know we, we want to see our blind spots uh, as we go through this process we're, we're taking every step to to have people critique us and say no that's not good enough or that's not the way you should be doing it and um, as we learn as we go along how to do this best that sounds great yeah. thank you so my last question for you both is um so thank you so much for sharing everything about minds um what what's on the horizon for minds where are you up to now and kind of what's coming yeah, there, there, there are some practical things, and so this 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 won't solve the problem, because it, but it will help a particular ward. There'll be different types of wards with different problems, you know, different contexts, I suppose. So, so, so this is the start of a journey for the, for a minds type approach. So there's two. So the next phase will probably be some sort of they call it a hybrid trial, where we'll start to look at different sorts of wards and and can we apply the same sort of thinking or discharge processes there. And look at barriers or, or reevaluate them so th this could go on and on that's one aspect of the sort of the science of it but what sarah brings also and, and we would support you know is making a difference what sarah wants to not have journal publications she wants to make a difference and that's really good grounding for us you know we want to be telling people about it telling people what's possible both in the process and the outcomes and um, so that's very much on our minds so that's that thing. And there are some practical things like about recruiting. So, it's a, so we're about to move to the phase now of recruiting for from the from the we've got our wards. But we want into service users and staff and carers, you know, board members, <laughs> whoever but we've got a, a quota of types of people we, we, we want to attract um, to take part in some 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 um, interviews or focus groups to help us understand what's going on at the moment. But that's the phase right right now. Um, and perhaps Lisa, you can you can remind us how people might get in touch if they're listening to this, if they are, are we're looking for, for 
of carers, people discharged in the last year, which we will try to find, but staff members particularly, aren't we, that, that perhaps they think they've got something interesting to say around uh, this. Would they get in touch via our mine's email or how, how would that happen? So if anyone um, listening is a staff member, service user or carer who would like to be interviewed, who's currently either in um, HPFT, so Hertfordshire, NSFT, that's Norfolk and Suffolk NHS Trust or ELFT, which is East London Foundation Trust, can email us on minds.project at nsft.nhs.uk or look at our website. If you Google search for NSFT Minds Research Study, you should be able to find us and we have our contact details there as well. We're looking to interview people from kind of now until Christmas probably about their thoughts on discharge, what's going well, what's not going well, what would you like to see changed? And anyone taking part this year if they wanted to, could be invited to the design workshops next year where we will really shape and kind of think about the discharge care approach that we're hoping to design and then implement in the in the third year of this research project. I just wanted to build on what you said, John, about accessible outputs um, aimed at wider audiences. And I suppose that is what the value of, of people coming to this. You know, I understand that a lot of the people who are you know, the academics on the programme do need to get publications in high impact journals. But I think and, you know, that will no doubt happen. But I do feel that it's really important that we that we spread the word in in different ways, targeted at different audiences. And we're working, uh, for example, uh, the charity Mind have agreed that they're going to help with our dissemination work to ensure that people with lived experience can find out about what we've been doing and um, what the findings are. I also think in terms of the value that I think there's something around the co-production that I didn't really mention, which is about the challenging the traditional power structures and flattening hierarchies, which actually in this team hasn't been very, hasn't actually been too difficult because everybody seems to be like-minded. We're all on, you know, we're, it, it feels as though we're working on a more or less level playing field. Um, and and that that I think in in certain areas of particularly um, medical research, there are often very uh, marked hierarchies. So that was one thing I was really keen to address. Um, I think then when you get that, you get that benefit of combining research and you get the research expertise with the lived experience expertise, you are getting sort of the best of both worlds. And also, of course, you're delivering research that has greater social accountability. So I think those are some of the, the real value in what we bring together as a, as a sort of contrasting, you know, some pe two people with different skill sets and, um, you know, very different uh, life experiences in terms of your academic background, John, and my very non-academic background. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Any final words? So I'd like to just say that we're hoping to apply for further funding for a bigger trial mm -hmm. to really robustly evaluate. Although we will be doing an evaluation as part of this study, it won't be on the scale of a sort of, um, a, a, um, well, I've forgotten it now, an RCT, a randomised control trial, that was what I was trying to say. And I think ultimately for me, what I really want to see coming out of this project is ultimately that the findings influence and inform national policy and guidance so that where with the nice guidance there is a gap you know they say discharge planning should be collaborative and um, led by the individual but they, the missing bit of that is the how how does that happen so you know we want to put so that guidance can be more explicit and more helpful we want that how to be in somehow that to be conveyed in guidance and policy um, documents. So that's my hope. I don't know what you, how you, you foresee the future and what you would think would be an outcome that you would really want to see from this. Yeah, I think that, I think the same. So that's really well put that final point, because I think that's really what is this is about the studies. They're all very clever and million pounds here and all this stuff, all these clever people. But 
that's what would how do you do this well is, is, is we want to understand and demonstrate so the same for me i mean i have learned a lot though and quite often now i, I look when i more ideas come in i think oh we have a methodology in mind that we could take bits from or replicate or do something similar in eating disorder or it doesn't matter really and whatever because the, the the process by which we're doing it seems to seem so seems to give such relevance so it'd be interesting to see how how we develop this more discharge from community services would, would be an example you know um rather than just inpatient stays so yes i'm I, yes I, i'm personally looking forward to learning a lot more as we go along yes and i think we you know um of course the the, the ultimate aim is to improve the discharge experience and outcomes for people and um we know already that over 50,000 people per are discharged from mental health inpatient units every year and that is not an insignificant number of people so it would be it would really um have a widespread impact if we can if we can get that change to policy and guidance that we hope will be informed by the study findings and i, I think i'd like to end on some quotes because i told i mentioned that we did some patient and public involvement work and some of the, the quotes were really hard hitting. So one person said, I was sent home in a taxi at 8 p.m. at night, no food, no gas, no medication and no follow up. And then someone else told us the consultant literally woke me up one morning and told me that I had, tw that I had 10 to 15 minutes to pack all my belongings because I was being discharged. There was no warning so that I could have, so that I could have been able to mentally prepare. And again, from somebody else, I was discharged straight into Jimmy's night shelter. Jimmy's weren't expecting me. I'd been in hospital for two weeks, no care plan, no follow up. That's so I think that's why we're doing the work. Yeah, definitely. That really says it all, doesn't it? Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on minds and how it's been getting to this place. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, John. <laughs>